Well, you can take the loon out of forfer, but you can't take forfer out of the loon, as they say. Uh, I was born in Forfar in 1948, and uh, my wife often says that I look at things through Forfar eyes. My wife comes from Edinburgh, she sees things through Edinburgh eyes, which are sometimes quite different from Forfar eyes, but she says I always look at it through Forfar eyes. Well, how could you describe Forfar? Well, you could never, I don't think, claim that Forfar was a hotbed of left-wing militancy. <laughs> I don't think anybody would be able to say that. In fact, one of the great frustrations of my early life was the sheer psychophancy and groveling and crawling to the Airlies, the Strathmores, and particularly the royal family <laughs> and the Queen Mother. Now, the Queen Mother, as you know, comes from Glam's Castle, which is just along the road from Forfar. And uh, they often said that in 1936, after the abdication crisis, the headline in the courier should have been, Forfar Girl Becomes Queen. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother would not have a bad word said about the Queen Mother ever. She did have a few criticisms about her younger daughter, the Princess Margaret. I remember on one occasion when my mother said, that Princess Margaret, she's just a, 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 and so my wife and my father, and I leaned for she was going, she's just a, 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 a cow, that's what she did. <laughs> so that's how highly my mother rated the Princess Margaret. But the Queen Mother and the Queen, you were not allowed under any circumstances to criticise. If I said uh, my mother, I've heard it said that the Queen Mother in the privacy of Glam's castle now and again enjoys a wee bit of a snifter. <laughs> and uh, my mother would say, well, if that's true, she deserves one. <laughs> <laughs> she never said that about her father who took a horse. <laughs> so, for, for very much not a left-wing place. I was brought up in the boys' brigade, and I had to walk about and Union Jacks and all sorts of things like that, saluting people, all that sort of thing. That was very strong in Forfar. Uh, it was only when I went to university in St Andrews in 1966 that I began to realise that I wasn't actually the only rebel in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I took a final for a realise that, yeah. It's surprising, therefore, that this particular episode occurred. It's also surprising, or maybe it's not in the context of what I've said, it's maybe not totally surprising how little known this episode actually is. I spent 18 years in Forfar, and I had never, ever heard of it. And yet, at least one branch of my family, the Potters actually, they were my father's folk, they must have been very much involved in this. Very much involved in this. They were Duke factory workers. They must have known about this. They must have been involved in it. And yet, I never filtered through the generations. Just occasionally, just occasionally, you would find a hint. Uh, several people said something about there was once a time when a union official ran away we are the money. <laughs> <laughs> and usually it came in the context, again, sorry to come back to my mother, uh, she's a very, very important person in my life, indeed everybody's life and mothers are very important. Um, and uh, uh, she would often say when she saw somebody like uh, uh, um, what do you call it, Arthur Scargill, on the TV, or Jack Jones, or Hugh Scanlon, or some of the trade union bosses, says, aye, they're all the same. There was one in Forfar that ran away with all their money. <laughs> and when I pressed her on details about this, she didn't really know very much about it at all. Didn't really know very much about it at all. In fact, she knew nothing about it. So, it came as a surprise when I was working on my book, Forfar on this day in history, 
I found a few indications in the columns of the Forfar Herald and indeed the Dundee Courier about this strike and lockout in Forfar. So I got very interested and I started to read about it. I discovered that the Forfar Herald was very, very sympathetic towards the workers and the Dundee Courier I know it had a reputation in my, in my young days at least for being extraordinarily right wing, as indeed it was. It was not unsympathetic at all to the forfer workers. It was quite neutral and uh, if anything you would say it was slightly something glad when it was all settled um, and so on. The influence of the Dundee Courier um, incidentally on forfer and the Sunday Post in particular was very, very strong in my childhood. Very, very strong indeed. Funnily enough, DC Thompson didn't seem to have much effect on Dundee itself. They never ever persuaded them to vote Conservative in Dundee. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they ever did. Uh, but they did have a huge effect on people in Kirinmuir, Montrose, Arbroath and Forfar, where voting Labour or Scottish Nationalists was almost looked upon as a sin. You were almost a pariah if you said that you voted Labour. Again, my mother didn't like that. <laughs> so, what happened exactly? First of all, let's think of what Forfar was like in 1889. It was by now, more or less, totally dependent on jute. Linen to a certain extent, but jute uh, it was actually quite a prosperous place. Forfar had got in very early with the railways. The railway from uh, Forfar to Arbroath opened in January 1839, and very soon it was, you were able to transport your goods all over the place. So factories in Forfar really did very well. It was quite a prosperous place. Uh, it is also, I think, like loads of these Scottish towns, it had a strong emphasis on the literary side of life and on education. Literacy was very, was widespread. Uh, you can see that by the Forfar Herald and the Forfar Dispatch. They print literary things and appreciations of works of Shakespeare. Loads of plays, loads of Shakespeare's came to the uh, Shakespeare plays came to the Reed Hall in Forfar and things like that. And a tremendous stress, as I say, on education. Very proud of its school, the Forfar Academy. Well, it all seems to centre on two people who were the union leaders. One was a man called Adam Farkerson, and the other one was a man called Tommy Roy. Sometimes they call them Rob Roy, as a, for a joke. But uh, uh, Adam Farkerson was a well-respected Forfar draper. He was not a factory worker himself, but he seemed to be very much involved in the Factory Workers' Union. He was a very respectable middle-class Forfar gentleman, and there's a lovely tombstone of him in the Forfar Cemetery, and it shows how well uh, he was loved and respected when he died in, I think, 1931. Tommy Roy is the one who is more interesting. And he's possibly more interesting because, because we know very little about him. There was a song sung in his honour. And it goes to the tune of the Victorian music hall favourite, Clementine. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling, Tommy Roy. He's my darling, the worker's darling, he's my darling. Tommy Roy. He was young, he was charismatic, and crucially in this dispute, he worked for the Forfar Herald. In fact, he's sometimes described as the editor of the Forfar Herald, which wouldn't surprise us because there was probably only two people who worked for the Forfar Herald. <laughs> but it was a very vital thing in the dispute, as we shall discover. 
He came from Crief. He was an incomer, as they would say in Forthor. He wasn't a Forthor lad. He came from Crief. He'd be born in Crief, and he lived in Queen Street, uh, Forthor. Now, what happened was, in about September 1889, the Forthor workers began to realise that they were being underpaid compared with the workers in Montrose, Arbroath, Brechin and Illith, Kilimure and Dundee. Now, that wouldn't have mattered so much in the pre-railway age. We are now very much living in the pre in, in the railway age in 1889. People are always going on trips on the railway for a lovely station. So your brother would live in Kirimuir, your sister would live in, uh, in Brechin, and you'd go and visit them. And naturally you'd talk about your wages. And you discovered that they were earning more than you were. And that, of course, is a shocking thing. Working class people, generally speaking, don't get too upset about the profits made by oil firms or the money spent on the royal family. They don't get too upset about the outrageous profits that are made by people. But once they hear that somebody down the road is doing the same job as they are and getting 50 pence a week more than they are, that's when you get trouble. And this is what it seems to have been all about. The wage structure in uh, the jute industry was very, very complicated. Because there were various people, you know, lappers, and they, they, they earned something. But, but there were people in Forfar who were earning as low a wage as 12 and 9 pence, which was not really very much. Uh, I know there's that famous Dundee song about the fairly ma mac you work for your, sometimes it's 2 and 9, sometimes it's 10 and 9. Uh, I don't know what age that was, that was written, or whether that was true or not, but certainly 12 and 9 pence in 1889 was not considered to be all that much. So, they held a meeting in the Drill Hall in the New Road in Forfar, and they decided that they would organise a strike. But very cleverly, they didn't go for an all-out strike. If I may say so, it's a wee bit like some of the strikes going on these days, the rolling strikes and so on, so they've always got enough money to pay out uh, strike pay, and so it's very clever uh, the way they did it. And Roy and Farkas realised this was a very, very uh, good idea, this is a very good thing, and uh, they, they had a strike at Dons and Creeks, not all the, 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 the factories in Forfar, just Dons and Creeks, and only some of them, but enough to uh, cripple them, if not totally to paralyse them. But, of course, the owners were rich, and you don't get rich by being stupid. And they twigged that the uh, union could only keep the workers out as long as there was money coming in to the union from those who were still uh, um, working. So they, a month later, <coughs> imposed a complete Lockout in Forfar. Every single factory in Forfar was closed by the owners. Every single one of them. Apart from Laird's. Now Laird's factory, if you know Forfar, was uh, when I was young, it was called the Tweed, and it's opposite the Reed Hall. And uh, they broke ranks. And they kept going. They actually paid their workers the same rate as they got in Dundee. <coughs> so they were out of it. The workers there were very happy. They had got a pay rise without really doing very much for it. And Laird's actually profited. Because as you can imagine, as you can imagine, any order that came for jute or linen uh, would go to Laird's because they were working. So Laird's did well of it. And Laird's were well liked. Not so Don's Craig's and uh, Lawson. But, excuse me, I think my jacket off is a little warm in here. Um, the, um, yes, the Lairds, as I say, they broke ranks. But Roy 
and Farquharson were again very well organised and they went on a series of lecture tours all around the county of Angus telling people what was going on in Forfa even went as far as Perth and Kirkcaldy and Dunfermline on occasion and they always finished their lecture tour with a wee bucket into which people were invited to put a few pennies and they collected loads of money that way they would not have been starved out they probably would have won if it continued longer than it actually did because of the sheer organisation and administrative ability of Roy and Farquharson. But support came for the workers from three very, very unusual and very, very unlikely sources in Victorian Britain. One was from the judiciary. Now, in Forfar, the legal system, it's all done by sheriffs and baileys and things like that, who are all local councillors, and they all know the issues, and they all know the people that come in front of them, they all know the local drunks and everything like that. So they, they knew what was going on, and they were very wise when disorder broke out, as it did on two occasions, they were very wise in the treatment of the offenders. They didn't get heavy with them. They let them off and warned them and said, the young ones, you should get your backside kicked and various things like that. But they didn't come down heavily on them. So the judiciary, you can see, under the guise of neutrality, was actually on the side of the workers. The second source of support was, as I've hinted before, was from the press. Now, the Forfar Herald, which was the only local newspaper uh, in these days, the uh, Forfar Dispatch had started several years previously, had uh, several years previously, but it was only just adverts and a few, there was no journalism and no, and nothing like that in it. But the Forfar Herald was the important one in Forfar these days, and it was 100% on the side of the workers. And of course we know the reason for that now because Tommy Roy worked there. And Roy was able to use the press, all right, rather like in uh, um, uh, later on next century when people like uh, Beaverbrook and that used their own papers to make their point. And dare I mention DC Thompson again in Dundee. But Roy used it to make his point. And as people in Forfar didn't read a lot of newspapers other than the Forfar Herald, and the other ones read were the Dundee Courier, which I have said was surprisingly neutral on this issue, if anything, siding with the workers, uh, the uh, people in Forfar read the Forfar Herald and said, our cause is justified. And indeed it was. But then we come to an even more surprising source of support for the workers. And that was the church. Now this one totally hit me between the eyes. Because I thought, with my rather simplistic view of history, that the church existed in the 19th century for no other purpose than to retain the status quo and it used the word Lord indiscriminately as it were Lord meaning Jesus Christ on the one hand and Lord the Laird and they used them I think quite deliberately to indicate you know to uh, get people to think that uh, the Lord if you obey the Lord you're obeying Jesus and you're also obeying the Lairds of the estate I'm sure they did that but here was to my surprise that the church sided with the workers. The Baptist church, which met in Manor Street, was absolutely, totally on the side of the workers from day one. Their minister was a man called the Reverend Cowper. He appeared on platforms with Roy and Farquharson 
and uh, totally in favour of uh, um, the, the, the workers. Or rather more surprisingly, the old Kirk minister, the Reverend George Kai, as he was called, who was a Canadian, he sided with the workers and also appeared on platforms uh, with the, the, the workers' leaders. A man called Phillips, who was the minister of the Free Kirk. Now, the Free Kirk was, uh, you know, not the parish church in that argument in the 19th century. They also sided with the workers. And this absolutely amazed me to find that the church, for once in history, I know my wife when I say that, for once in history, the church seems to be doing its job. It seems to be doing what it says it does. It seems to be supporting the poor and the weak against the strong and the mighty. When evidence has often existed that it's doing no such thing. To the contrary. But that was the key thing, the, the church. And this, of course, led eventually to yet another source of support in Forfa. And that was, of course, the local shopkeepers. Now, their reason for supporting the workers <coughs> was pretty obvious when you think about it, because if Forfar is locked out, there is no money to buy the goods. No money to buy the goods. And they look at the moral leadership of the town, they look at the um, uh, church, which says the workers are right. The workers should be paid more. And therefore, the shopkeepers are quite happy to say, yes, we're going to support the workers as well. So everything was really very much in favour of the workers. We hear of loads of meetings at the Drill Hall and the Reed Hall, where the workers they cheered Roy and they cheered Farkerson uh, and so on, and they sang that song that I sang about Clementine, my darling Tommy Roy, and also the French revolutionary song called Ça ira, Ça ira, Ça ira, Ça ira. If you look it up on YouTube, you find Edith Piaf halfway up a ladder going Ça ira, Ça ira, Ça ira. You know, and we're going to put them, uh, get them all guillotined and so on, you know. <laughs> and they were singing that one in 1889, which incidentally was exactly 100 years after the French Revolution. That is maybe saying something. But there are reports of that song being sung in the drill hall and indeed the reed hall. There were two incidents of disorder. One was when Gilbert Don, who was the managing director of Don's, and he was the arch villain, when he one Saturday morning decided to walk from his house in Briar Cottage, which is to the west of the town, to his uh, factory in St James's Road. And as he came out of his house, he was pelted with missiles, <laughs> mud and so on. And as it was October, he was particularly pelted with potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, potatoes, as you know, are in plentiful supply around about Forfar. Even in the potato harvest, when I went gathering tatties, you got to steal as many potatoes as you want. You got to steal <laughs> as many as you want because there were literally millions of them. You know, you wouldn't go uh, bankrupt if you were a potato farmer. So I think the farmers even uh, gave people potatoes, said you have potatoes. And of course, I think potatoes then went to the soup kitchen which the Baptist church had organised, and that fed people. I think that was a, another, yet another source of support. But anyway, potatoes on this occasion were thrown at Gilbert Dawn, as indeed were bits of mud. It was youngsters who did it, you know, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, apart from one lady. She was a famous lady in Forfar, apparently, called Auntie Betts. And she lived along the Glams Road, and she shouted things at Mr. Don, threw things at Mr. Don, <laughs> and she was arrested. 
she was arrested to the disapproval, I may say, of the crowd. When she did appear in court, she was immediately dismissed because she was obviously suffering from dementia or something like that. She was a well-known local character whom everybody knew and not necessarily loved, but they knew who she was. And they weren't going to put her in jail. So she got away, and uh, the, the other youngsters who had thrown these things at Mr. Don, which actually bespattered his coat with mud, as the Herald puts it, uh, they were given a warning, said, you're bad boys, don't do it again, you're not helping your cause, don't want to see any more. That was the first outbreak of uh, disorder. Second one was possibly a little more serious, or at least it could have been, because there were adults involved in this one. The owners had been to a meeting in Dundee to talk to other jute owners. And of course, the only way you could get from Forfar to Dundee in 1889 was by, by railway. So they knew they would be coming back on this train because they knew when the trains would be. And the workers were waiting for them. And uh, the owners came out, and first of all, it was booze and shame on you and things like that. And a few stones were thrown. A few stones were, there were two policemen on duty. Not nearly enough. But then again, it's further we're talking about. <laughs> and the policemen know everybody. And everybody knows the policemen. You know, and the policemen would be able to say, look, look, look Jack, just, 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 I mean, I, I've honestly seen this happen in the uh, football crowds in Forfar. I thought you get a lot of football crowds in Forfar. But I've seen this happen. Yeah, yeah, uh, the policemen who know the guys are able to say, come on, come on, just, just calm down, you know? And, and they, they can do that. That could have been a lot more uh, violent, a lot more nasty, but they nevertheless, the crowd, the unruly mob, followed the workers as they came out of the railway station and then they went along Carsburg Road down Castle Street getting boos and cat calls all the way. And then, when they got to the pend, as it's called, at the cross, Tommy Roy himself came out of the Forfar Herald's office and stilled the crowd. He said, come on, let's go, we're not helping him. And of course, they maybe wouldn't listen to anybody else but they did listen to what Tommy Roy said. And uh, that night, Tommy Roy, his meeting in the Reed Hall, said, we're not going to get any place with that sort of behaviour. Can we maybe just cut, cut, cut it down? So, it went on until November. The Forfar Herald talks about starvation. I suspect there's a wee bit of a rhetorical exaggeration here. I think that uh, Don and Craigs, and now they would have starved them out if they'd had to. If they, if, they, if they had to, because I think they were really rather nasty people. You probably get a what get a side them on by. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were really rather uh, nasty people, uh, and uh, but maybe they didn't quite get the starvation because of the soup kitchens uh, and so on in, in Manor Street, uh, but eventually. Eventually, the owners gave in. Now, one of the reasons why the church was so much on the side of the workers was because the ministers of the church got the bombs rush. That was a phrase you have. It was an American phrase. It's a recent American phrase, but it disappeared in either the Courier or the Glad, the bombs rush or something like that from the owners. The owners would keep them waiting and say, what do you want? They said, well, we're trying to negotiate the settlement, go away. So that is not the way to treat the church. But it was the church who did do the mediating. Eventually what happened was they brought a minister in from Dundee and they asked the minister from Dundee, could he possibly mediate? And I think by this time, there was, two months later, there was an appetite for settlement. 
I think the workers had had enough of poverty. I don't think it was starvation, but it certainly was poverty. And I think the owners began to realise were actually losing more money by this going on than by settling it. I sometimes wish the people would think of it like that today, incidentally, as well, the current strikes that are going on. But uh, uh, they eventually uh, came to this agreement, and what happened was that uh, uh, everybody got, the, the 12 and niners got six shillings or something like that, everybody else got a wee bit, but not very much for the women. Now the women, the women of course, were a large part of the workforce. Basically because women, now I don't, I'm not being too sexist in saying this, but women tend to have smaller fingers than men, is that right? Yeah. And therefore they are far better at weaving. Far better at weaving. But what, the ones that got the settlement were the men on the grounds that they had a wife and family to feed. In the agreement it said the women were to be given favourable consideration in the future. <laughs> now those of you who know anything about politics and trade union disputes know that means absolutely nothing at all. <clears throat> That's given for the benefit of the journalists. It means nothing at all. And uh, women continued to be underpaid compared with men in Falkland. And the surprising thing was how quickly the whole thing disappeared. The whole thing disappeared. Don and Craig and people like that uh, had been shunned by some uh, shopkeepers, had refused to serve them and things like that, and uh, they had to send their maid servants up the curry to get the food and all sorts of, sort of things uh, like that happened. But then suddenly, they just appeared. That was it. Once they agreed, they were immediately welcomed back. Everybody seemed to get on together. And Forfer went back to being its own one happy family again. I don't think it was necessarily all that happy, but it did finish by Christmas 1889. Uh, in early November, you're talking about starvation. By Christmas 1889, uh, you're beginning to talk about selling Christmas cakes and things like that in the uh, Forfar Herald. Now remember, Christmas wasn't a huge thing in the 1880s, but they began to sell Christmas cakes and, and that sort of thing, implying that prosperity had returned. And of course there was now more money in the economy because the workers were paid that wee bit more. <coughs> and that may be another reason why this episode is not so well known as I feel it should be, simply because it disappeared so quickly. Disappeared so quickly. There were, however, a few aftermaths. Adam Farkerson, as I say, remained a well-respected and honoured citizen in the town. He became Bailey, I don't think he became provost, but he was Bailey and various things like that. And his tombstone was, uh, uh, when he died, 1931, huge funeral for him, and that sort of thing. But Tommy Roy suddenly disappears. There is a mention of him, there is a mention of him in 1892, I think, if I could just check my date, yes. Um, it uh, says that in 1892 he suddenly disappears. Uh, he is mentioned as being president of the Scottish Mill and Factory Workers' Union. So he moved on to national thing, where he delivered a few stirring addresses. There is an oblique reference to him in the early 1894 in a report of the Forfar School Board, where someone has to be co-opted because of the continuing absence of Thomas Roy. So what has happened to Tommy Roy? Well, did he run away with the money? <laughs> <laughs> that is possible. That is possible. Perhaps, perhaps he met another lady. Perhaps he got fed up. Perhaps he had some mental breakdown or something like that. Uh, was there some other scandal? Who knows? But Thomas Roy suddenly disappears. And... When 
Fankerson is buried in 1931 in the account of the Fall for the Dispatch. It mentions that Bailey Fankerson is well known for his involvement in the workers' dispute of 1889, and there is no mention of anybody called Thomas Roy. I think that's true of one of the papers, I think the other one does say, along with a man called Roy or something like that, but it's a dismissive uh, thing about him. So, what indeed has happened to Thomas Roy? Well, I had an awful job finding anything about him at all. In uh, 1911, he is living in, let's see if I get my facts right, according to the census, he is living in Lark Hall in Lanarkshire. He's still called a compositor, which is the, the newspaper industry, that would not surprise us. But that's the last, uh, sorry, 1901 he's living in Edinburgh, 1911 he's living in Lark Hall. And Lark Hall is the last we hear about him until we find his death certificate in 1916. He died at the age of 54 in the Hamilton Combination Poorhouse of hemiplegia, which we would call a stroke. Uh, he'd been moved there, it says, from the Schott's Poorhouse. His wife, Isabella, had died a month previously of cardiac disease and dropsy at 14 Mitchell Street, Creef, and she's described as being married to Thomas Roy, the compositor. But they don't seem, therefore, to have been living together at that point. So therefore, who knows? Now, I had to work hard to find that information about the death of Tommy Roy. There was no mention of him whatsoever in either the Forfar Herald, the Forfar Dispatch, the Dundee Courier, or any place, unless I've missed something, and if anybody does find something, do let me know. But uh, uh, it doesn't seem that he was uh, anybody bothered with it. Now, you could say, of course, that was the middle of the First World War, and the, the newspapers are full of deaths on battlefields and so on, like that, and things aren't normal anyway. But it still is a bit of a mystery about what happened to Thomas Roy. I would have loved in my book to have found a photograph of Tommy Roy, for, for my book. No such thing seems to exist. I got the Forfar Library to look for it, they found nothing. That place out near um, Rostenith, the Angus Lab, they found nothing at all. If anybody can suggest any place else, can they find a photograph of Thomas Roy, I'll be delighted to hear about it. I did manage to find a photograph of um, the Reverend George Kai the one who supported them, and also the MP was a man called John Shiris Will, in eight, that's a picture of him in 1892. Uh, he was a man who did not involve himself in dispute on one side or another. It was rumoured that uh, there was a story that, uh, that I read someplace that he had been, he had some connections with some uh, Dundee Duke barons, which is possibly true, and that might explain why he didn't say anything. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the uh, for for lockout. Uh, it's interesting in a way, uh, well, it's interesting in many ways, but particularly interesting to me in that there is so much more that I would love to find out about it. In particular, what did happen to Tommy Roy? Did he run away with the money? Did he have a mental collapse because of guilty conscience? Did the sheer strain of keeping this going, did that affect his brain? <coughs> Maybe not, because he was still described as a compositor in uh, 1911, 1901. He was still a compositor, he was still working. <coughs> so I don't know what on earth happened. It's still one of these many things in local history that you have to say, I don't know. But I'll conclude by saying that the whole thing, as I say, surprised me because this happened in Forfar which, again, you don't associate with any kind of, uh, of militancy. And the main thing, of course, was that really shocked me was the church. And we're talking here about the established church, the Church of Scotland. I'm not surprised that the Baptist Church 
was on the side of the workers because they tend to be radical and left-wing anyway, the Baptists. But this is the main stream, Church of Scotland, actually supporting the workers against the owners. Now, I thought that part of the deal was the owners would say, we'll build you a stained glass window as long as you pay your part in keeping the workers down. But apparently not here. So a very, very interesting part of history. And the one thing, other thing that makes me just to conclude, are there any place in Forford, Brechin, or any place else, any other wee episodes like this that seem to have been forgotten? I would love to say, I've, I, as you know, I live in Kirkcaldy, and I've looked for similar things in Kirkcaldy. Nothing seems like that that happened in Kirkcaldy, particularly. particularly. Uh, Kirkcaldy had very good relationships in the linoleum <coughs> factory, incidentally, but not so in the coal mines. Uh, obviously, that's for reasons that we know. But I just wonder, are there any other episodes that are lost in the mists of antiquity and buried in the files of newspapers that we could find out a wee bit more about. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me.